Okay, well, hello. Gather around if you're here for the 12 o'clock public tour. So, my name's Lucas Livingston, and uh, for the next hour or so, we're going to be uh, going around the galleries, exploring a few works of art, and uh, what's the title for this topic? One Ring to Rule Them All. Yeah, where does that come from? Oh, yeah. What, what? Yeah, The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, right, sure. So uh, I, I took that title as a bit of inspiration. We'll, um, we'll certainly make a few passing references to uh, Tolkien, but uh, we're also going to be exploring the art of rings in general, um, so, and also more broadly speaking, ring as a bit of a, a metaphor, and um, ring even beyond the mere finger ring. So uh, it, it'll be a lot of fun, though, uh, so, so don't let that deter you. And uh, our first stop is going to be ancient Egypt. Going back thousands of years, although these objects actually though are rather, rather late as far as ancient Egypt is concerned. They come from the Ptolemaic period, so around the year uh, 300 to 30 BC. So, but still, that's over 2,000 years old. So these, these objects are over 2,000 years old. They're a little hard to see, so I do have some some blown up pictures here. There are two different rings. The one on the left. The hieroglyphs are really a challenge to read, but uh, there is a reference to the god Osiris written in the hieroglyphs. Who is Osiris? Yes. I think he's the Egyptian god of death. Yeah, the Egyptian god of death, the god of the dead, the underworld. Yes. Uh, and uh, but also in ancient Egypt, death. That's not the end. That's in part a, a new beginning. Yeah. Uh, when you die in ancient Egypt, you'll be reborn in the Egyptian afterlife. Uh, so to live a, a new life, in, like in, in the Egyptian version of heaven. So on this little golden ring, we've got uh, Osiris as well as the name and titles of the um, the deceit, the, the the person who wore this ring in death. The other ring just to the right, a more circular or, or oval ring, and it shows, it's a little hard to tell as well, even on this photograph, but uh, can anybody make out what we have on here? Yes, yes, we do have Isis, and who's Isis? Does anybody know who Isis is? Hmm. Well, Osiris was married to Isis, I'll tell you that, so she's a goddess. Please, yes. Is she nursing? Yes. yes, yeah, it's a little tough to tell, but you have Isis sitting on a throne, and yes, the little baby Horus is, is there. So she's nursing Horus, and she's wearing a crown. And actually, that, that little decoration on the ring is very similar to this statue that we have here of, of Isis nursing <laughs> Horus. What other functions uh, do we find, or whatever other symbolic purposes do we use the rings for uh, today and in antiquity? Marriage. marriage. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Uh, why do you suppose a ring for marriage? What's that all about? Eternal. Eternal, no end. Eternal, no end. You said love is eternal. Yes, yes. So a ring then is this unbroken hoop. So there's no beginning, no end. It goes on forever and ever. Yeah, so love eternal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How were they acquired? Actually, the fun thing is you can always tell a little bit of history about artwork in the Art Institute if you look at the credit line. So this says, uh, gift of Henry H. Getty, Charles L. Hutchinson, and Norman W. Harris. And then it has the, um, so that means it was a given to the Art Institute as a gift. And then it has the accession number, 1894.265. That means in 1894, the Art Institute acquired this ring. Um, so, and it was the 265th work of art that we inventoried that year. And the one right next door, 1894, so the same year, a little, little later on the inventory lift, as a gift of, of Charles Hutchinson. So same, same fellow, these, both of these rings, Charles Hutchinson was involved in, in our acquisition of them. Well, we're not going to look at any actual proper finger rings anymore. We're done with that already. But now we're, we're, we're branching out and using the, the word ring and the, the notion of ring in a broader context, a little bit of a metaphor, you could say. And so what's the ring that we have here? Giant circle. 
<laughs> well, we've got a giant circle, yeah, and it's, it's a tricky uh, uh, ring to figure out. Uh, often it's called a ring of fire, a ring of flame. And so we see this wonderful circle around the god Shiva dancing his cosmic dance, the cycle of creation and destruction. And then all these little things going around, they kind of look like hands maybe, but those are little flickers of fire. He's also holding a very similar shaped flicker of fire in one of his outstretched left hands there. So this never-ending circle of fire uh, around the god Shiva. I mentioned the god uh, creation as well as destruction. So often we hear the god Shiva being called the god of destruction, uh, the one at the end of the whole cosmic cycle. Uh, it's Shiva's job to push the restart button, and he, he sends the whole world into this great fiery conflagration, so we see the fire around, so engulfing the world and, and turning it all into ashes. But then, well, the, touching on our notion of the ring, this never-ending loop, in a sense, a never-ending cycle. A co clock keeps going around and around. It's a never-ending phenomenon. One day ends, a new day begins. So likewise with the whole universe. The universe comes into existence, it exists, and then it uh, dies, and then it's uh, reborn again, in a sense, like reincarnation. Just in the Hindu cosmic belief, the Hindu belief of reincarnation. We live, we die, and uh, we're reborn again. Um, and uh, so, likewise, the whole universe undergoes this cosmic cycle. Shiva, the god of destruction, but also creation. It's, you can't have one without the other. Creation begets destruction, which in turn begets creation. And so this never-ending ring of fire, this fire, the cycle of uh, the cosmic, cosmic cycle. Dancing the dance of creation, dance as this meditative, uh, yogic, transformative state. What's under one of his feet there? Can you see what, what he got there? Yeah. It's like a sort of baby or something. It's like a sort of baby or something. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, okay, thanks. It, it's okay, though. He's not a bad guy trampling on a baby. It's an evil baby, so it's all right. Uh, a baby or a, a demon in some interpretations uh, trampling down this this demonic force which represents our own human vices, uh, our, 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 our missteps, you could say. So he's trampling that down to help lead us towards uh, a more proper way to live, towards uh, to doing the right thing, uh, enlightenment, towards, towards spiritual enlightenment. So living according to Dharma, the rule of law. Any thoughts about Shiva and the, the ring of fire before we... Uh, before we step on out of here, yeah, please. I noticed that, she, why does she have two extra arms? Because does that have anything to do with Yeah, all these extra arms. First, the, she, you, you said she, and it's a bit of an intention that the artists want to represent Shiva looking not really totally like a guy, not totally like a woman, a, a bit androgynous, you could say it's a bit uh, ambiguous. But yeah, all these multiple arms, actually count them, one, two, three, four arms that he has there. What does that tell you, first off, that he has four arms instead of the usual two? God. Yeah. Something very supernatural. Something very supernatural, yeah. So we might instantly go to, okay, well, this is definitely not a regular person, something supernatural, uh, maybe a god, uh, or we sometimes also find demons with multiple arms and multiple heads. So, but, uh, yeah, yeah, so it definitely tells us that this immediately, right away, is it's not... It's not a normal person, uh, but a supernatural being, yeah. It's also practical because he needs to uh, hold different items and tell us a story with his hands. He's telling us a story with two of his hands striking what's called the mudra, M-U-D-R-A, all these many different gestures, these hand gestures that each convey a, a story or a message or uh, in the case of one of his hands here, is he's telling us, don't be afraid, I'm going to take care of you. Think like he's, he's reading out, he's, he's, he's patting you on the shoulder, he's saying, I'm going to take care of you, everything's fine. And the other one here, it's... Um, it's a little more of a complicated mudra. It, it, um, it's in one simple uh, reference, though. He's calling our attention to one of his feet there, which is lifted off of the obstacle to enlightenment. So it's this uh, gesture uh, calling our attention to uh, a path to enlightenment.
All right, now we're going to go really far flung away from our preconceived notions of ring, and we're going to go into China. All right. All right. Well, here, here's our here's our stop right here. How about that? Okay. Ah, yeah, I pulled a fast one on you all. Well, where's where's the ring here? The sound, yeah. What are these objects before us? Yes. They're bells. Yeah, absolutely. They're great, wonderful bells from ancient China. From uh, around the, well, the year the labels help us. They tell us the late 6th, early 5th centuries BC. All from roughly around the same time period. <coughs> it's called the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. Zhou, just like the name Zhou. Uh, but spell, we spell it Z-H-O-U. Uh, that's, that's the hazard of trying to transliterate um, something from the Chinese script into something we can pronounce, and there are different ways of doing it. You'll see different transliterations. There's some accepted standards. That's getting on a tangent. That's less interesting than the bells themselves. So these wonderful colossal bells... Uh, from ancient China, made of bronze, the same material as the dancing Shiva we were just looking at. So they have this wonderful green patina that builds up. Normally you think of bronze, it might be shiny, uh, or it could be a little darker, kind of like the uh, lions in front of the museum. Those are made of bronze as well, and they also have this green patina that builds up over them. What about the shape of these bells? How do you suppose you'd play them? Yeah, what were you going to say? Well, to carry, we do have the large uh, slots on top and the hoops for, for carrying them or for, uh, for setting them up. But what were you doing? Do you stick like a stick in there instead? Yeah, you know, here's the fun thing. We have the multiple shapes, multiple sizes, and uh, we so often think of a bell maybe, okay, in a church tower or, or a clock tower. You'll ring the bell and it's this single lone bell. But sometimes you're lucky and you'll hear... Uh, maybe, uh, what do you call that when there's multiple bells, like uh, caroling, yeah, right, you'll have uh, multiple bells, so uh, playing different uh, different tones. They don't have a, a clapper, yeah. so you'll, you, you can't ring them like a normal bell, you'll strike it with a hammer, and so in ancient China, you'd have this full assembly of multiple bells, so diff ranging in different, oh, yeah. different uh, sizes, so for... And what happens when you have all these bells of different sizes? Each one makes a different sound. sound. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a piano in that sense, with each key making, hitting a different a string to make a different sound. So each, each bell makes its own different sound, so ranging on a scale. So you could definitely play a full musical uh, arrangement with uh, striking these, these different bells. And in fact, actually, I've got... Um, a couple fun things to share with you here. I've got a recording. Now, we don't know exactly how in ancient China how these bells may have sounded, but uh, we can, we can uh, play around and recreate some of the sounds. And uh, one fun thing, actually, before I play it on the iPad, I've got a little bell here that we can play. So, yeah, one of my volunteers uh, took a bronze casting class and uh, was very ambitious, and he made a little bell. So the fun thing is with these bells, with the way that they're shaped, is uh, theoretically, I don't know if on the miniature bronze scale, but if you strike it from uh, the side, it makes one sound, and strike it uh, or on the edge versus the side, theoretically makes a different sound. And maybe I'm a little tone deaf, but we can pass this around if you want to go ahead and strike it. So you can, yeah, it's easy to hold it by the top, and you can ring it. So yeah pass it around, have some fun, as long as it makes its way back to me. And while we're doing that, I'll also play a, uh, a musical performance here of uh, traditional bells. Interpretation, but still. And so you can see someone from uh, from in front and along the sides going along and striking with different bells. So, turn that down a little bit. 
Well, some of the decorative motifs, I guess, since we're, we're doing good on time, but uh, we see wonderful designs uh, decorating the surface of the bells. The one at the far right, actually, we, we've gone ahead and done like a, a, a rubbing impression of the, the main emblem on the side, which uh, it's hard to tell what that is. I'm looking at the, at the, the rub, rubbing. Oh, finished? Did everybody have a chance to ring the bell? Who wants to ring the bell? All right. Well, if it strikes you later on, I still have it. But <laughs> the mood just takes you away. But so some sort of a, uh, it's interpreted as a monster mask is the common term that is often used. We can see uh, the two tusks down below and uh, the great horns up above. And then there, there's this central raised ridge with what look, looks like two big flaring snouts there. And then the two eyes on either side of the, um, the raised n nasal ridge there. So this, this monster mask, the term that's often used, it's called a tautia, T-A-O-T-I-E, tautia. We, we don't exactly know where that word comes from. It was a term used in somewhat later times to describe in the ancient Bronze Age this monster feature, but even in the ancient times we're not exactly sure what they called it uh, and whether it's meant to be a, uh, a composite fantastical creature or if it's meant to be some uh, stylized representation of a, a bull or a bovine creature, so we're not totally sure, but we do think that we can trace its evolution over time to evolve, you could say, in the arts into creatures more familiar to us in, in from, ancient, or from Chinese uh, um, motifs like uh, dragons and, and ogres and, and such. So. Also these interesting uh, round knobs, uh, different thoughts, maybe those are used to help control the resonance of the bell. Any other thoughts before we uh, head on out of here? So here we are at the circus with, uh, well, multiple rings. Where are the rings in this painting by Toulouse-Lautrec? The arena? The ring itself, the arena, the, the circus ring. It's only later on when we get the notion of the three-ring circus. That might be a P.T. Barnum innovation or Bailey. Uh, the ring, ring uh, the, uh, seat, the seats uh, go around the, uh, the arena as a ring. Yeah, absolutely. The ring master. Ring master, yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do find this ringmaster, well-known gentleman from the Cirque Fernando. Yeah, what's happening in this, this scene? Or what's just about to happen? It's going to jump through that hoop. Yeah, so we have a uh, acrobat woman seated here on the horse. This is the, the back end of a horse, if you can see that. The wonderful detailed hoop down below. The ringmaster is leading her around and she's leading the horse around and just about to... Uh, can you make out what's going on up here? It's a little tough to tell, but... Uh, a, 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 a clown! Yeah, yeah, with you can tell the wonderful black and yellow colorful stripes, uh, the socks, yeah. And uh, so standing on this tall platform with the great big balloon pants that he has, and, but he's holding something, this white Ring. Yeah, what do you suppose that is? This is the skin and she's going to yeah. jam through that. It's a hoop that he's holding, or a ring, a paper perhaps, and she's going to jump through that uh, hoop that he's holding, jump off of the horseback, jump through, presumably do a, a somersault in the air, and then land on the horseback again and continue galloping around. So there's a few rings that we see in the circus here. Circuses, this is from uh, 1887 to 1888, uh, and circuses, the Cirque Fernando is a very well-known circus in uh, Montmartre, the, the uh, gritty urban nightlife of uh, late 19th century France. Circuses were popular, urban attractions, well-lit at night. Uh, but what, this is a, a curious scene, though. It, it's, how, what, what would you say uh, as far as the turnout? Yeah. Actually, I, I've always interpreted this as a rehearsal. Because you, of the, as far as the interpreting rehearsal. it as a rehearsal. A behind the yeah, behind-the-scenes yeah. rehearsal like, rather like than like a... Like a God when he did it. <laughs> yeah, so it could, yeah, could be... Yeah. Yeah. What were you saying? I, I think it looks like the owner. You know, someone that's oh. making it to these folks up here yeah. look like, like owners, like yeah. they're making a decision, some sort of business arrangement yeah. or such. It also looks like one of the gentlemen holding a, 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 a crop 
similar to the Ringmaster of Whip of the Sword. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a curious scene, though, it's, uh, how drastically the figures are all cut off. Their, their heads, uh, the, the clowns, both left and up above, and then the, the folks sitting in the stands, the, the poor man and woman up there, so nicely dressed, but so unceremoniously cropped off. The other fun thing, though, adjacent to this um, painting, we also have a tambourine, a painted tambourine. You can gather around a little more closely and have a look. So another ring of a sort, another hoop. It's uh, very much the same subject as our larger painting of the uh, equestrian at the Cirque Fernando. So we see the, the very sketchy backside of the horse running around the, uh, the hoop of the ring of the circus and about to jump through the, uh, the hoop that the clown is holding up. So perhaps the, the ring shape of the tambourine was uh, in, inspiring for Toulouse-Lautrec to paint this scene. But there's another interesting theory about why he used the tambourine uh, for this painting, and it's none other than that there was in Paris at this time a place called, a lovely establishment called Café Tambourine, and Toulouse Lautrec uh, enjoyed going to this location in addition to other artists. Here's a painting at the uh, Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, painted by Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, in the Café Tambourin, or Café Tambourin. This is the, uh, the, the proprietress of the Café Tambourin. And we see her seated at a table shaped like a tambourine, on a stool shaped like a tambourine. Very good. <laughs> so a lot of fun. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left, and one final stop uh, left on our, uh, our tour, but not too far away. We're really going off on a, a far tangent here, but this object was my original inspiration for the, uh, the, the title, One Ring to Rule Them All, and the whole broader theme of uh, the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbits, and Tolkien. Uh, any guesses as to why or what? <laughs> Does it, it look like, like one of the hot? It looks like Gollum, as far as I'm concerned. Gollum, a creature from, from the Lord of the Rings. So, uh, you know, separated at birth, I tell you. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's a purely a connection, visual connection that I'm making, based purely on, on my own, uh, I don't know, neuroses. But uh, this this wonderful uh, plaster, it's made of plaster, this, this piece, but uh, patina as though to resemble bronze, uh, uh, a lovely plaster piece dating to uh, 1892, so right around the same time as uh, Toulouse-Lautrec was, was seriously uh, working on the arts. So it's called The Frogman, or uh, Le Grignard, uh, pardon my French, uh, and uh, the artist uh, Jean-Joseph Carrier was uh, keenly interested in, well, the medium of plaster, uh, which typically was derided a bit as a, a, a crudish uh, uh, imitation or cheap uh, uh, material that was used in contrast to marble or bronze for more lofty works of sculpture. But uh, he was also keenly interested in uh, these uh, uh, semi-grotesque creatures uh, some also uh, see uh, a, a connection with Darwin theories of evolution, uh, of uh, connecting humanity to our uh, earlier uh, amphibian roots when, when uh, animals emerged from the water. Look at his hand. Look at his hand, yeah, yeah it's great it webbed hand that he has. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, uh, just for those, if we're not terribly familiar with the, the Lord of the Rings, this ring of power, as I touched on at the beginning of our tour, uh, it was a hobbit who first uh, found this ring and uh, held on to it for centuries, which eventually did consume him and changed him into this, this creature, Gollum. So once a hobbit, uh, and then eventually morphed into this ferocious-looking uh, little beastie. So we see this, this transformative effect from, from man to, to frog-like being as well in the sculpture.